it might seem like basic information, but you should try and get this into your head, right? This is what your honeymoon is, is it's effectively, it's the holiday of a lifetime. Never again will you take as expensive a holiday, relatively speaking. You might take holidays that cost more, but chances are in the future you'll have family and all kinds of other obligations. This is the one for just, you know, the standard one is the two of you. Um, and I always say, is, does anybody know where the honeymoon came from? Like, so the honeymoon is actually an Indian idea. Uh, it was developed in India and it was people with a bit of money that would get married and then would spend a month visiting relatives around India that couldn't make it to the wedding. And that was the honeymoon. And when the British went to India, they said, oh, this is a very pleasant idea. So they brought the idea back in the late 18th century. And so the idea of a honeymoon, so, I mean, although I hope you don't get to go visit all your relatives and I hope you go to go somewhere else. So nowadays we think of it as the holiday of a lifetime, but, and I presume everybody here has traveled a bit. So the idea of just like a fly and flop holiday, although still a very popular idea for um, a honeymoon, nowadays it's like it is, it's essentially what you define it, you know? Um, so as I said, it's the most expensive holiday you'll ever take, um, relatively speaking. And it's also, and this is important, a chance to treat yourself to luxury. And the reason why the luxury is important as opposed to desirable, I mean it's desirable, but it's also important, is that because generally speaking, weddings are stressful, planning a wedding is stressful, having a wedding is stressful. Yes, it's the happiest day of your life. It's also one of the most stressful times of your life. And so the idea of kind of pampering yourself for the life that's to come. And again, I'm speaking in standard terms where you're going to go back to work, you're going to start a family, you're going to take on all of the obligations of life, so on and so forth. And so this is the chance you get. And uh, so that's why providers of honeymoons, they take account of all of these things. They take account that you want a bit of luxury, that you have a budget, and I'll talk about budgets in a second, that you have a budget that you mightn't have again relative to the kind of holiday you're going to go on. Um, all right, so step one, plan together. Because I've seen it happen where uh, generally again, and I don't in any way want to be accused of being chauvinistic, but like generally where the, the woman in the relationship is going, look, I'm taking care of the actual wedding day. Here, go, go and plan the honeymoon. That's mad because you're just, you're opening yourself up to disappointment because next thing you know is you've planned a honeymoon that you kind of, enjoy and then the other partner is going to go, are you out of your mind? Like, um, so this isn't really. So, and the best way to do it is, is that because it, we all, as I said, we've all traveled, so we all have different ideas of what constitutes our dream holiday. Separate and make a list of the top five things that matter the most, whether it's destinations you want to go on, the kind of holiday, your dream holiday. Is it a fly and flop holiday? Is it a cultural holiday? Is it an activities holiday? Is it a combination holiday? Is it a double destination holiday? Like, and the things that you want out of your thing, and then compare your lists. Bring them together and find the common ground. And that will resolve a huge amount of the, I don't know what kind of holiday I want, or like, you know, where you're kind of at loggerheads. And, and so you, you will find that an awful lot of things, and then you can start to pick the destination, then you can start to pick the kind of honeymoon you're going to go on, and more importantly as well, when you're going to go on this particular honeymoon. Define your budget. Again, traditionally, a honeymoon works roughly around 10% of your overall wedding planning budget. Now, you know, these are, these are necessarily, these are guidelines, they're not rules. People will have a much cheaper wedding because they will either they're putting money aside to buy a house or, or they're going to blow it all on a honeymoon because, you know, what the hell, a wedding is a day, a honeymoon is forever. You want to figure out how much do you want to spend. So set yourself to go. Don't pick the destination and then go, right, well, how much do we have? Pick a number that you're both comfortable with, that you can both obviously can afford, and then base your decision making on that. Um, so you're going to ask yourself in order to pick how long you're going to go for. Generally speaking, the faraway destinations, you want at least 10 days, 
usually two weeks and then if you really can, if you can take the time off work, if you, know, if you have that kind of maybe three weeks. And for some people, and again, and again, it's very common and maybe there's someone in this room who's going, you know what, we're actually going to go traveling for a year. You know, um, it is what you want. But for near destinations, you can go for a week, a week to 10 days. I mean, generally a honeymoon, minimum 10 days. That's, I, I would I re strongly recommend. Any less than that, and like you're, you're, you're just barely distressed from everything that came before and you're getting on the plane to go back home again. Um, add a margin of 10%. The reason why it goes back to the first point about luxury. You can allocate your budget for flights, for accommodation, and you can have a per diem for food. But then what happens when you get to the destination and you discover that they have... I don't know, whatever, they have elephant trekking or hot air ballooning or you can go kayaking or something. And somehow the cost, the extra cost of that isn't factored into your budget. The one thing you don't want to do on your honeymoon is say no to anything. In the sense of like you don't, I, mean, I don't mean that you want to buy a suit made of gold or buy shoes made of diamonds. I mean, it's like you want to give yourself the opportunity to do those things that perhaps you hadn't done before and that you might never get a chance to do again. So allow yourself a margin of 10%. Generally, I'd put it on a credit card and worry about it another time. But um, that would be the... Uh, so, and prepay your hotels and flights so you don't have to worry about it. And make sure your flights are taken care of and your hotels. And I'll get to working with a travel agent in a second, which for a honeymoon, I think, is highly, comes highly recommended, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. Okay, when to go. Our summertime, obviously, is June to August, early September. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's the other way around. So you have like the hot season and the high season is December through March. Uh, so you need to decide where you're gonna go, right? It's strongly recommended to go after the wedding. Not everybody can and not everybody does, but there is a really strong logic to going directly after the wedding. As I said, and I don't want to underestimate, I certainly don't want to put the frighteners of anybody, but the stress of planning a wedding and the stress of having a wedding, of having, you know, is Auntie Mary okay, like her celiac problems, are they being addressed? You're thinking about 14,000 different things. On the happiest day of your life, you're actually playing super host to all your nearest and dearest. And that's the reality of it. I mean, it can be a brilliant day. Uh, and so the idea of being able to disappear right afterwards is like really welcome. It's also, um, it's also one of the only times when your employer will give you an extra bit of forbearance, okay? You're going to consider a number of seasonal factors. You're going to consider the weather. If you're going to the tropical destinations, the so-called honeymoon places like your, your Maldives, your Mauritiuses, your Seychelles, you've got to picture that in our summer, it's generally their low season, which means that they have, they're in, hur in, in the Caribbean, it's you're in the hurricane belt, which doesn't mean you're going to get a hurricane every day, but you are at risk. You're gonna, generally going to get rains. Now, anybody who's been to the tropics will know that it doesn't rain all the time, that when they talk about the rainy season, it might rain for an hour in the morning, and it might rain for an hour at night, but generally speaking, the, the weather clears really quickly. It's still very, very hot. The humidity is probably a little high, but you're not getting that kind of dry, super hot weather you get in the high season, which is generally December through March. However, like I, I'm an amateur studier of weather patterns and I've, real, I've noticed that over the last 10 years, like what used to be the high season in say places like Thailand, where you would, it would stop raining in mid-October and it wouldn't rain again until May. That's no longer the case. It's, it's I mean, I suppose changing weather patterns, whether you, global warming, El Nino, whatever it is, it, it, it's shifted weather. So that, but generally speaking, the rules still hold true. Um, also remember, when you're determining your budget, peak season. So in the Southern Hemisphere, in the tropics, peak season is December to March. So it means the prices are highest because their bookings are highest, their accommodation, the, uh, their, um, their numbers are higher. You're going to get discounted, like for example, you will never get a cheaper hotel to places like the Maldives than you will in say late June or early July. There's no other time of the year where you'll get a better deal to go to the Maldives, the Seychelles, Mauritius and so on. So to plan it yourself or plan it with a travel agent. Anybody who knows me and I've been doing this for a long, long time on radio and in print will always say, and the lads will always say, I've always encouraged people to be independent travelers. It's where I come from is the independent traveler sector. So the idea of just like planning things yourself, it gives you a sense of ownership. 
over the holiday. It gives you a sense of adventure. I says, I will absolutely say to you, if you're planning a honeymoon, use a travel agent. There's a number of reasons for it. You have a thousand other things to be thinking about already. Second of all, this is a complicated holiday. Short of just going to one destination, one hotel, one beach, and you're going to eat in the same three restaurants, generally speaking, for all of the reasons that I've mentioned already, the honeymoon or the trip of a lifetime, these are complicated trips. You might travel to two destinations. You might change hotels. You might change flights. Travel agents are experts in this. They know exactly, and particularly when it comes to planning those super special holidays like a honeymoon, you'd be crazy not to avail of their expertise. They also know that that hotel that's really, really cheap in that destination you've researched online, it goes, it's really, really cheap for a reason. It's really, really cheap because it's 75 miles away from the airport. It's near nothing of interest to get to and from the air. The hotel is going to take, you know, it's going to cost you a nightmare in taxi fares and hassle. So it's not necessarily, I mean, it doesn't mean that you abrogate your sense of responsibility. You, you, you go in, you have all of the things that you have in your list. These are the things we want. This is the kind of hotel we want. This is the kind of experience we're looking for. And a good travel agent will be able to listen and take account of everything you're saying and give you recommendations based on that. They'll also find you the best package deals. So you can package the trip together. So you can get flights and hotel, or you can get hotels, car, activities. You know, you, you, you can structure the package any way you want. And a good travel agent will always sit down and work with you. So I would say use the internet relatively sparingly. I mean, like, again, this is my own experience. Let's say, for example, you're going to stay in a five-star hotel in Chiang Mai. You're going to go to the Four Seasons, you know? And, like, if you just stick to what the Four Seasons are going to tell you, and I'm not just picking on the Four Seasons, but any of these big resort kind of luxury resort places, they're wonderful places, and they are amazing to stay in. The rooms are fabulous, and the treatment is wonderful. But they're kind of isolated a lot from the destination that you're traveling to. So I would recommend, when you're talking about small ticket items, it's like booking trekking tours, or walks, or guided, anything, anything that's, anything that's going to be an activity you're going to take on. Do that yourself, because if you book it through the hotel, they're going to price gouge you to death. You know, and, and the experiences generally, and I don't mean always, but generally aren't as good as the one you can find out yourself. You can look on traveler forums, you can find, like you want to go on a walk, I don't know, you're going to go trekking in the Himalayas or in the Andes. Like, yes, the hotel will arrange a trek, but it, generally speaking, they never are as good as the one that's the expert in the town. So that's what I mean by small ticket items. Do that yourself. Uh, and leave everything else to uh, the travel agent. Oh yeah, of course, and that's the other thing is, a travel agent is licensed and bonded, so if anything, God forbid, should go wrong, you'll get your money back. That's, I mean, sorry, that's by far and away the single most important reason. Um, okay, make it special. Now here's one, there's lots of different things. Um, I mean, I, I was talking to somebody, a, a friend of mine, and she arranged, what she did is, she arranged the honeymoon for her and her partner. And what she did was she got in touch with her partner's boss to arrange extra leave but without telling him. So she arranged it for an extra four days, which as we know, working, that's, you know, it's effectively an extra week. And so when they're on that, and so he was kind of, like she told him early on enough, but like just the surprise of going, oh, by the way, we're not coming back on the 24th, we're coming back on the 29th. And he's like, well, what do you mean? Is this like, oh, but like I have to get back to work. He says, no, no, it's okay. I've cleared it with your work. It's like a present from the boss. You will never get a present like that again, ever, short of, you know, the birth of your child. But the boss will never give you that kind of forbearance. Hopefully you have decent bosses. Um, the also as well as this, like, and do this when you're arranging for your partner. Like, oh yeah, sorry, this is another popular trend. I don't know how you feel about this, but like people go on honeymoons and then for the last few days they invite their friends. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a popular it's an increasingly popular thing. When you look back on the list that you've made with your partners, the things that you like, is your partner really into cooking or art? The destination you're going to, find out, is there, like, is it possible to arrange a special tour of that art gallery that your partner dreams of going to see? Or, or if your partner's really into cooking, can you arrange, like, a one-on-one -on -one cooking class with, like, 
through the hotel. You know, there's ways of doing things to make that little extra special touch. And I'll say it now and I'll say it again at the end. You have no idea what goodwill you are in, engendering in people, in the tourism industry, when you tell them that you're on a honeymoon. It's, it's like it opens doors. People are delighted with honeymoon couples. You will get upgraded. You will get, I mean, generally speaking, you know, the champagne and the strawberries on the bed when you arrive, that's fine. But it's, it's that we've, we've moved you from the deluxe room into the junior suite. Because one is that because people like the good vibe of a honeymooner. But not just because they want to be decent people, is they know that it gets it's brilliant publicity for the hotels. People like the old, the old kind of hoary chestnut that people like love is, is actually quite true. It's good business. Love is good business in travel. See, travel agents have good relationships with hotels. This isn't just about you know, taking that crappy four star, selling it to you as a five star, but simply because they get a good deal. See, the travel agent doesn't want to misrepresent either. It's really important that when you come back from your honeymoon, you come back a really satisfied customer. If you don't come back a satisfied customer, your friends who are getting married next June aren't going to go to that travel agent, and the travel agent knows that. So when you come back and you go, oh my God, it was an amazing honeymoon, it was way more than we expected, and you know what, and the guys at whatever travel agent you pick, they were amazing. The friends, nothing, nothing is better than word of mouth, nothing. And, so, and everybody in the industry knows that. And so they will do that. So if you let the agent know that you're going on a honeymoon, what they will do is they will let, let the providers know, the hotels, etc. And the chance of getting an upgrade, I'm not saying they're guaranteed, but the chances of upgrades and that little extra touches go up exponentially as a result. Um, so, and you'd be surprised at what happens. It's like, you'd be surprised at what little touches matter. Let's say, for example, you're staying in a hotel, you fly into the destination, but the hotel is 40 minutes away. And you have arrived, you've flown 13 hours, and you're thinking, all right, okay, now how are we gonna get to the hotel? And because the hotel knows they're expecting, you know, Mr. and Mrs. O'Reilly, newly married wedding couple, I've heard it happen, where all of a sudden they'll send a car, and the car, and the guy's there with the sign, and all of a sudden, your transport to the hotel is taken out of your hands, you don't have to worry about it, and, you're try and it's those little touches that make the holiday that bit more memorable. But unless you let people know, um, you can't, it'll, it won't happen. Very, very important to manage time. Um, for the first three days, again, I cannot underestimate the effect, how exhausted you're going to feel if you do the classic wedding, next day, leave. Do nothing for the first three days. Don't plan, flop out. Just chill out, relax. Um, Travel clever, not often. Very twin destination honeymoons are incredibly popular nowadays because one, it gives you a chance of breaking up the monotony of maybe sitting on a beach for two weeks, which a lot of people are like, oh, here. And so you might do a week of beach and then a week of something else. The one thing is you don't want to do, this isn't a you know, visit Europe in eight days or I'm going to do Asia in two weeks. A honeymoon shouldn't be like that because when you look and you say, oh, it's only an hour flight, Yes, the flight actually might be only an hour, but that's eight hours of travel time between checking out, going to the airport, checking in, waiting for the flight, waiting for the bags, you know, so on and so forth. So every flight you take is effectively one day out of your honeymoon. So try and keep your flights to a minimum. Going there, leaving to go home, and maybe one transfer in between. Anything more than that on a two week or on a two and a half week holiday is just adding stress and unnecessary kind of movement to a honeymoon that is meant to be just essentially a relaxing holiday. If you, in your, when your budget, whatever, whatever level of accommodation you're going for, whatever level of dining, keep a little something for that last night. Go out with a bang. If you're gonna pick, if you're gonna stay in a five star hotel, if you can only afford a five star hotel for one night, do it on the last night. One, you have something to kind of build up to and it's a brilliant way of going out. Like, you know, that really kind of, and then maybe you can have a spa day or, you know, you can go and do something, I don't know, whatever it is. But really, kind of, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna build up to luxury, keep it till the last night. Right, how many destinations? Um, you know, again, when I give these talks, I never tell you where to go because one is, is that you know where you wanna go. Um, 
But, you know, the twin centres, Thailand, the Maldives, South Africa, Mauritius is a very popular one. If you're going further afield, Tahiti and New Zealand is popular, Hong Kong, so on and so forth, if you have time. Uh, beach and safari is a popular option. Um, you're going to need some downtime after, particularly, and do the safari first, maybe, and then do the beach, because you know, anyone who's been on safari, generally, if you're going on uh, game drives, like you're up at five, um, earlier even, you know, you're kind of cold. and sit So, you know, you kind of ease into it. Again, I said it before, I'm going to say it again. Modesty is fine, but in moderation. Do not be shy about why you're there. We're, we're a honeymoon couple. You have no idea. Again, I cannot stress how many doors it opens. And we Irish are awful at this. Like, generally speaking, we're kind of like, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. I don't make a floor. I don't make a floor. No, no, it's grand. I don't know. We'll wait for an hour. I know, I know we, we had our booking for seven. Oh, no, no. No. Like, I don't mean be bolshy. I just mean tell them why you're there. You, it really is. It's quite something. You'll get all of this kind of stuff. Discounts. Um, room upgrades in low season. Listen, they're not selling the honeymoon suite, you know, the night you've arrived. You mightn't have booked it, but they'll give it to you. It's good publicity for them. Listen, these are general travel ones. I won't go to pack light, pack once, unpack. You don't need to bring. Seriously, you do not bring, you don't bring an outfit for every day, you know, um, and you don't need to pack six novels. If you're packing six novels, I'm questioning the basis of your relationship. <laughs> um, and, oh, yeah, pack before the wedding day. Have the suitcase in the corner, ready to go, well before, because the last thing you need is coming in after the whole wedding day and then the next day, and, you know, the ants that have come up from Clonmel, they need to be entertained in the morning. Like, all of that stuff. Like, then you're going, oh, Christ, I need to pack. Make sure that it's done before. Um, and then generally, look, if you're going to go backpacking, anybody who backpacks, no, 75% full backpack. Do not bring a full backpack, ever. As I said, it's, it's like a lot of it is just practical. But the key things, again, to remember, this is, the, this is the trip of a lifetime, typically. No matter what way you plan your trip, or not what, no matter how you envisage your trip, you know, if you want to rough it across South America, this is the best roughing across South America trip you're ever going to take. If you fancy just the lie down in luxury in the beach resort, it's the best version of that you're going to take. So think of it that way. This is the one. You have a better budget. You have more time. And, uh, and then second thing is just like work with the travel agent. And thirdly, don't be shy. So there you go. That's my advice.